We're always taught that it's going to be some creepy stranger in a van, but it wasn't. What's happening, everybody? Welcome back. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 550, with today's guest, Ms. Robin Murray. I'm Jeremy Lesnick. I'm your host. I'm Whistlekick's founder, and I love martial arts, traditional martial arts in all forms. And that's why we do what we do. And if you want to see all that we do, go to whistlekick.com. That's our online home. It's the place to find our store. And the code PODCAST15 is going to get you 15% off anything you find in there. Now, everything for this show is on its own website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. The show comes out twice a week. And the goal of this show and of Whistlekick overall, really, it's all under the heading of connecting, educating, and entertaining traditional martial artists throughout the world. If you want to support that work, there are a number of ways you can help. You could make a purchase. You could share an episode with friends. Put it on social media. Make your family listen to it. You know, whatever. (laughs) Follow us on social media. We're at Whistlekick everywhere you could think of. You could pick up one of our books on Amazon. There are quite a few of them. You could leave us a review on Facebook or on Google or anywhere you get your podcasts. Or you could support the Patreon. P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Whistlekick. Patreon's a place where we post exclusive content. And if you contribute as little as $2 a month, you're going to get access to at least some of it. The more you contribute... The more we give you, in fact, at the $10 tier, we've got a new show. It's a show where I unpack the things that I do training at home. I show you the drills that I use that I've refined out of necessity and over the years. And, well, probably stuff that you're not seeing anywhere else from anybody. Today's show is intense. I've said that before, and it's been true before. And it's true again. In fact, this is the first time I feel the need to kind of offer a warning. The subject matter that we get into on today's episode is very real. It's very raw. And it may not be suitable for everyone. If you have trouble listening to stories of violence, or if you have small children around, you may... You may not want to listen to this one, or at least be aware of it going in. It's stuff that needs to be discussed. It's important subject matter. And I'm thankful to Ms. Murray for coming on the show and talking about it. And I don't know what else to say to set it up, because anything I say further just seems to dilute it. So let's just let it ride. Ms. Murray, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Hi, so nice of you to have me. Hey, nice of you to be here. We've got some stuff. (laughs) We've got some stuff. Just in the last five minutes, you 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 broached like three really big just topics, I guess. And and I know we're gonna get into them. And and I first off want to thank you for your willingness to be here and to unpack some big stuff. Mm-hmm. with us and the audience right now is going Jeremy what the what the hell are you talking about what's going on here uh, <laughs> but it's all it's all gonna happen we're gonna we're gonna let it we're gonna let it unfold as naturally as it can now of course we start in in a pretty generic way you know it's it's a martial arts show we're talking about martial arts with martial artists martial artists are listening and so when did you start with martial arts Um, The very first time I ever took martial arts, I was a teenager. I was 14 and I took Aikido and self-defense. And then I was in the military. I eventually became a sergeant in the army. So I did regular combatives and grappling. But most recently, I've been training for around two years. I started with Krav Maga, and then recently I added uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu to the mix, and I really love it. I really love the combination as well. That's quite the combo. I yeah. Mean, we, and and if we were, I, I don't know if martial arts lends itself well to a spectrum, and I'm sure there are going to be some people who might might get a little bit offended as I try to shoehorn this in. But if we were to 
to force martial arts onto a continuum of, let's say, aggressiveness. Aikido would kind of be on one end and then military combatives. You know, we've had a few guests who um, who participated in, even taught MCMAP, the, the Marine Corps martial arts program. And, and I assume the Army Corps is similar mm -hmm. in their combatives and Krav's kind of down on that aggressive <laughs> spectrum too, right? So it sounds like that's where you've settled, but I, I want to go back. I want to talk about the Aikido for a minute because it's such a contrast. Like, yeah. how, how did you end up there? Like, why Aikido? Why? at You said 14? That's not an age most kids jump into martial arts. No. Um, well, I have been having issues with people, I don't know, people wanting to fight. Like, for reference, I'm 35. So when I was coming up, even though I lived in kind of like suburban areas in New York, there were still people that wanted to like have gangs, form gangs, like worship, violence. And I was always kind of just a really soft-spoken kid that, you know, really wanted to be left alone. And when it comes to Aikido, the whole thing is it's not aggressive. It's like taking someone else's energy to use it against them. Right. Um, yep. Which is what I liked. But even then, when I first started Aikido, I was so docile, I would just say I'm sorry all the time. I didn't even like striking. <laughs> And was uh, was Aikido or was martial arts in general? Was that your idea or somebody suggested to you? You know, I don't remember. Um, I had been interested in it in a while. Like I was athletic as a kid to a certain extent. Um, I tried, I think, a little bit of everything. Like I really wanted to sample everything from the buffet of life. Like I was a cheerleader and I did... Um, school plays and I played softball and then I played lacrosse and then I was a civil air patrol cadet and um I really did like martial arts it was just I didn't have a lot of support outside of school to get to things mm. so it didn't last as long as I wanted it to but it sounds like it made a mark definitely just the way you're talking about it and when you think back on that Aikido time you you talked about how docile you were. Did that start to change through Aikido or was it something that, well, I, instead of putting words in your mouth, tell me more. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, well, you know, I really would probably have remained a very docile pacifist, had life and other people just not gotten in the mm. way of that. Um, and, you know, I joined the military. My family has a history of service. Um, so, you know, I had to start to become more aggressive. And one of the big things when I was deployed, uh, my first deployment was to Baghdad, like, right when I got done with training. And one of the things you absolutely need to do is like declare your space, right? And and know when someone's being hostile or acting hostile towards you. You kind of have to, in certain circumstances, be an aggressor. Um, and it was really foreign to me, but I had to adapt. It's one of those things like really, um, you know, adapt or die, essentially. Uh, and I was a machine gunner uh, during my first deployment. So it was kind of like, you know, be aggressive or other bad things might happen. Mm. And now, if, if I if I can jump in there for a moment, because I I have not served. I've not I've not been overseas. I've not engaged in the type of conflict that you're talking about. And the majority of our listeners haven't either. So I, I, I think I know what you're referring to when you talk about this claiming of space, but I'm wondering if you if you have a, a, an anecdote or a, a quick story that might illustrate that a little better for those of us who, who don't get it. Okay, yeah. <clears throat> so at the time uh, when I was serving, it was, I got there in 2004, left in 2005. 
a lot of the problems that we were having uh, were what we call the V-beds, vehicle-borne IEDs, car bombs. And they would drive up on convoys and get in the middle and detonate, um, which, as you can imagine, is disastrous and harrowing um, in any way possible. So we developed strategies to deal with it, like having signs on the back and fronts of Humvees saying, you know, stay X amount of meters away or we will shoot. Because the hard part about it is if you are in the position to make the judgment where you don't know if someone is just not paying attention in traffic or if they're coming to kill you, you kind of have to learn to be louder and to get attention um, rather than just wait and do something that you might really regret. That makes sense. That, that's a, t- that's a, a tough call. And it, it seems to illustrate in... I, I suspect we're doing some foreshadowing here. Mm-hmm. You, anytime we talk about self-defense, we talk about that that line, that moment where you have to make that tough call because if you wait even a little bit too long, there might be no getting out of the situation. And, and I mean, certainly you're talking about car bombs. Yeah. There's no there, there. There's a pretty tight span of time, I would imagine, where you have to make the decision: is this a threat or not a threat? Right. But on the flip side of that, um, that's an extreme case. It's, you know, it's hard to find any, any gray area in that whole, I need to be aggressive where more people would get hurt in combat because it's very cut and clear. You know what's expected. And even though you don't know who your enemy is, you're familiar with the concept. Uh, However, you know, when I was in AIT, for people who don't know, that's job school in the army, um, I was sexually assaulted by another soldier. And it wasn't, how can I explain it? It wasn't... I'm going to give a trigger warning. It wasn't a rape, but it was complete um, invasion of my personal space. It was like uh, touching. It was it was very unwanted. And, you know, he was a man who was a lot larger than me. He had been in the army longer than me. And at that point, it essentially made it feel like I couldn't have fought back even if I wanted to without having more negative things in the army come to me than to him, which at that point in time was an unfortunate reality in the military. And for a lot of women, it still is, <laughs> which is, you know, horrific. But further on i don't know if you want to pause there you're you're awfully quiet uh, yeah i'm the last thing i'm going to do when you're talking about this is step on your words yeah so um that happened in 2004 Mm -hmm. and then i went i was deployed uh right after and i didn't really have a whole lot of time to process it and honestly the way that it had been treated by everyone around me Um, It didn't get treated like sexual assault. And not until I started to do work with other women who had been sexually assaulted, did I realize like, yeah, that's what happened to me. Like, not only did he unwantedly touch me, he gave me unwanted attention. He threatened me. He threatened my friends. He wanted retribution. Um, It was just, it's a mess. So, you know, there's, that's one facet of it, the assault, which I'm very fortunate that it didn't have the opportunity to go further. Um, I count myself lucky. 
Uh, I know a lot of women have horrific, horrific and brutal stories uh, when it comes to that. And I'm, I'm thankful that it didn't, yeah, happen that way. However, um, the assault that happened 2004, I went on my first deployment from 2004 to 2005. I went to my second deployment in the Horn of Africa from 2005 to 2006, and then I came home. And I'd been dealing with uh, PTSD stuff for a long time. And I would say later on in 2012, I was dating a man who had been my fiance while I was still in the army. Um, someone I was really close to, like the first time I ever lost a friend in a combat and, and needed someone to call and talk to about that. Um, this is the man I called, but, um, our relationship had started to go bad and he had started to, uh, become like verbally abusive and try to get controlling. And he was involved in the motorcycle club scene, which I'm not making a judgment about all men in motorcycle clubs, just about him. Um, he became like macho and controlling and he wanted me to, I don't know, ask, act like a housefrau. And I was not all about it. That's not my personality. And, you know, I left. I was like, I don't know what's going on. I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not waiting for the other shoe to drop. So I left. And then when he found out I was dating someone else, he came to my house I was living at when I was alone on the porch and he assaulted me. He tried to kill me. Um, I got choked, I got punched, I got kicked. I ended up with um, broken ribs. Um, oh God, my face was messed up. My shoulder was messed up. And after that, I was just, I, I couldn't even process it for a while because it's one of those things where, you know, when we think of a, an enemy, when we think of someone that wants to hurt us, um, we're always taught that it's gonna be some creepy stranger in a van, but it wasn't. It was, it was the person that was my person. You know what I mean? The person that I almost married. Yeah. And it was just incredibly hard to deal with. And it still makes me very anxious to talk about. I, I've had to go through a lot of therapy, um, naturally, like someone in my position does. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> Quite, but, uh, quite reasonable and, and expected, I yeah, would say, at least, at um, least to healthily process it. Right. So when it comes to, you know, being aggressive, um, I can, I can remember like the first like punch to the face. I guess I'm going to get a graphic for a moment, but okay. I can remember the first punch to the face and I just remember being so shocked by it that the next thing I knew, um, he had had my hair and he was slamming my face um, on the sidewalk. And then the next thing I remembered is he was, you know, on top of me, choking me and telling me, you're going to fucking die. And the only thing I could remember out of anything I had learned in the military, in Aikido, in any self-defense class I had ever taken, the only thing I could think to do in that moment was to take my thumbs and drive them into his eye sockets. 
And even though I ended up taking a serious beating, um, that probably saved my life because I was on the verge of passing out. Um, but it's hard because there is a thought that goes in your head like, oh, I don't want to hurt this person. I love them. I don't want to cause them pain. Completely forgetting that, hey, they, pardon my language, they started it. <laughs> and as it turns out, that's, that's common in a lot of women um, because we're socially conditioned to be nice. Um, we're socially conditioned to be nurturers. And even though in that relationship, I had seen warning signs and I did leave, I had seen the signs earlier, but given my conditioning and every rom-com I've ever seen, I'm like, no, he's gonna change. He's gonna remember that he loves me and it's gonna, it's gonna be fine. It wasn't fine. And I think a lot of that does a great disservice to women. Like we need to be able to not feel guilty for not just de defending ourselves, but for taking up space, period. Um, uh, you know, just considering crime statistics, 40% of all women murdered in the United States are murdered by a partner or a former partner. That's staggering. And the number one cause to a cause of death to pregnant women, other than complications from childbirth, is murder of a partner. Wow. It's terrifying. I, I can only imagine. Um <laughs> You know, I'm 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 never going to be pregnant. I, I don't I don't have to worry about that. And I'm not, I'm not trying to to make light. I'm I'm simply trying to convey that that I recognize what I don't understand. Yeah. In this conversation, uh, you connected a couple dots here for me that I I, I want to go back to if if I may. Yeah. And that was the idea of taking up space. You talked about that mm -hmm. when you when you went to Iraq, and you're talking about that kind of in this this other context here, what does that mean? When you talk about a woman who maybe is, I'll, I'll use the word that you use, docile, mm -hmm. and needs to make that transition into taking up space. What, what, is, what does that look like physically and what does it feel like emotionally? Okay, so as far as, you know, being up, uh, taking up space, you know, there's another podcast that I listen to that I love called My Favorite Murder. And one of their slogans is oh, politeness, um, which, you know, vulgar words, but it makes a point because, you know, go back to social conditioning from a very young age, women, girls were taught to, you know, be nice, um, don't make waves. And we sacrifice often our feelings of comfort or even safety to make someone else feel comfortable. And it's, it's a process to start to unlearn all of the things that have kind of been forced on us, which is not to say um, everybody did horrible things to us growing up, but there are a lot of things uh, that, that do a disservice to little girls. Like, I don't make my daughter hug anyone she doesn't want to. Um, she's seven years old. I want her to know that she has absolute agency over her body and she needs to apologize to absolutely no one about it. Um, but just on a bigger level, um, you know, we need to know that we are valid. Our emotions are valid. Uh, we are worthy of being heard. Um, 
we are worthy, period. And we don't need to compromise our safety or ourselves to make someone else feel comfortable. Um, I'm allowed to have a voice. I don't need to quiet down or shrink myself. Sometimes physically, you can look at women and they will hunch over or round their shoulders almost to make themselves smaller so they're less um, imposing. Um, we don't really do that to boys or men. We have other things that we do to them that is also crappy social conditioning. I mean, you all, we all get the fuzzy end of the lollipop stick on that one, but um, the, the way that we treat little girls um, is kind of dangerous. Even now, like one in 10 teenage girls is, has been abused um, by a partner. That's scary. So when you when you think about some of these things that have happened for you and you're talking about some of this social conditioning, are there things that you remember from your childhood that you can point to and say, ah, I wish this had been different? I can remember dealing with, more specifically, when I was a teenager, my stepfather had like drunk, lecherous friends. And for some reason, I had to be nice to them. Well, no, I don't want to be nice to them. I'm 15 years old. I should be able to wear a bathing suit at my house and not have a 50 year old man look at me and I feel gross. No, mm. no way. No, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And this, this is stuff that I hear discussed more and more and I'm glad it's being discussed more and more mm -hmm. because it, the, in order for us to stop this behavior, that we need to reach some kind of critical mass, and and I'm not going to put pronouns on it. People yeah. speaking out on these subjects, holding each other accountable, right, is critical, and that's part of why you're here today to to invite some conversation. And it really, women are not the only victims. Um, you know, the statistics say one in seven men are also victims of some form of in extreme violence in a partnership. However, they're much less likely to report it. So we don't really know what the statistics are. But I had a close friend of mine who was a former Marine um, who, you know, his wife, who had been a kickboxer, um, used to hit him. And I remember he told me, he goes, you know, I just never really thought twice about it because I'm really big and it didn't hurt that bad. But then he got injured and she hit him in the spine one day so bad he passed out. And then when he came to, he had fallen down the stairs and she was still punching him in the face. Um, it's dangerous any way you shake it. Yeah. Okay. So we don't need to put a, a, a firm timetable on the things that, that you're talking about here, but there's some period of time or, or was there no period of time between this incident, this porch incident and you resuming martial arts? Um. Let's see, that happened in 2012. I restarted at the end of 2017, I wanna say. And how I came to it specifically, I'll give you, I guess, a little more background. Um, my daughter, when my daughter was little, I was going back to university. And uh, like I mentioned before, I was studying criminal justice in law at the same time with the goal of being a lawyer. However, um, all of the trauma and all of the things that I just did not deal with had come creeping up on me. And all of a sudden one day it, you know, got to a place where it was just bad. 
Um, and I had tried to fight it and I couldn't fight it alone, but I ended up getting really sick. I had to drop out of school. Um, I had to be hospitalized numerous times and I would get really frustrated because I really wanted things to be better. I love life. I love my daughter. I love new experiences. Um, but I had gotten anxious to the point of having agoraphobia. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's basically like a fear of the public or a fear of yeah. public spaces. I had become scared to leave my house. And I would get such overwhelming anxiety. Um, my pulse would be about 140 beats per minute for hours at a time. It was so bad to the point where I would shake. Uh, I could do literally nothing. Um, and I just kept going in the hospital, trying one med, and then that didn't work. So it would get overwhelming and it lasted on and off for two years. Um, and I honestly, I don't know how I made it through because it felt like torture. Um, I couldn't eat. I couldn't sleep. I wasn't really sleeping. I would just pass out kind of from the exhaustion and then wake up the next day at five o'clock in the morning with my heart beating out of my chest. And it seemed like for a long time, nothing I was doing was working or making it any better. Um, and then I found um, a, well, I, I wouldn't say I found, a PTSD treatment clinic was recommended to me um, by the peer support specialist at the VA where I live in Buffalo, New York. And it was a nine week residential PTSD program with other women veterans. And I was terrified to go. I didn't wanna leave my young daughter for that long but I knew that I was pretty much worthless to her at that time, unless I got some help, which I don't know if anyone listening it struggles from mental health, but I just want to let you know, you are not alone. It does get better and people care about you. That is all I needed to hear. And for some reason, doctors, would not tell me that <laughs> um, until I got to the PTSD uh, clinic. So I was there for nine weeks uh, with other women and it was nice being with women veterans because you know we had the ability to understand each other, not just as women and not just talk about you know uh, combat, uh, but you know, sexual assault as well. And usually when you go to therapy, it's one or the other, like combat, you know, therapy for combat trauma or therapy for sexual assault or, you know, other things. And we, all had each other and we all understood where each other were coming from and the programming that they had for us there, the, the different types of therapy and the things that they introduced us to um, was amazing. And I don't know where I would have been without it, but when I found out about BJJ, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, that's where I was. Um, one of the other women that were in the PTSD clinic with me, she was a blue belt in jujitsu. And, you know, the one day she had offered to teach some of us, you know, different grappling techniques. And I was like, yeah, 
I was like, hell yeah, I want to do that. So I remember her teaching me simple stuff, takedowns, this, that. And, you know, how long is it? It's been like five years and we're still friends. We train mm-hmm. jujitsu together now sometimes. Uh, when I got out and when I got enough space and, and healed at least somewhat enough from trauma and, and found the right meds where I could be in public, I was like, I'm going to join a gym. I'm going to do it. I'm not going to mess around anymore. I'm going to do something because at that time, my daughter was starting kindergarten and all I had at that time was anxiety and time on my hands. (laughs) So I decided to do something about it. And I Googled, you know, Brazilian jiu-jitsu gyms near me because aside from her, I had at I had other, you know, male combat vet friends tell me, you got to try this. You're going to like it. I'm like, all right, whatever. So I went into the gym and I go to Spar Self-Defense in Buffalo, New York. And primarily they have Krav Maga and Jiu Jitsu. They also have like different kickboxing and stuff. But I walked in and it was a off hours. So there was nobody really in there. And they're like, Hey, what can we help you with? I was like, I want to learn self-defense. I'm like, and my friends have been telling me about jujitsu and the guy behind the counter who I now know as my coach, coach Matt, he is like, if you're more interested in self-defense, you might like uh, Krav Maga a little bit more. And I was like, well, all right. I, you know, I'm willing to give it a try. He goes, well, you could try a class for free and see how you like it and go from there. I'm like, all right, cool. Got my schedule. I went and then I was all about it. Um, and it, at first I was very apprehensive to go in, um, even somewhat apprehensive to train with men And I can specifically remember uh, being a white belt and it was my first or second month of training. The first time we were learning a choke defense and when somebody even just put their hands on my neck, not even squeezed, but just put their hands on my neck, I had an anxiety attack burst out crying and went in the women's locker room and broke down. And I just remember being so embarrassed until one of the other women, my class came in with me and, you know, she asked me what was wrong. And I was like, I, I'm getting choked up just thinking about it. Um, I was like, somebody, somebody tried to kill me this way. And I'm not, you know, super comfortable with it. And she's like, that's, you know, she had been assaulted. That's why she was in the class. Turns out a lot of the women that I train with train because they were assaulted. (laughs) Um, And she just made me feel comfortable. I talked to the coach I had about it. And he's like, you don't need to do it. Uh, right now you can take your time. And I was like, there's gotta be some like leeway in between. So for a while, while we were training the defense, instead of putting, you know, putting hands on my throat, people would put their hands on my shoulders. And then I just, after a while, I got used to it. And then I got a little bit more confident defending it. And now Man, with jujitsu, I've got marks all up and down my neck from brush burn being choked with my gi, and it doesn't even bother me. (laughs) It's just that slow, like, slow introduction of things and then taking the time to get comfortable with techniques and being closer to people and training with larger men. Because even though I had been training Krav Maga for a while, by the time I started BJJ, um, having 
a larger man in particular, like put all of his weight on me inside control, I would just, you know, not even consciously thinking about it, I would just panic and scramble to get out. Um, so it was something I had to work on consciously and, you know, talk to my different coaches that I trusted, like, man, you know, as soon as this happens, I panic and all I want to do is scramble. If you see me start to panic and not breathe, let me know I'm panicking and not breathing. And can we unpack that a little bit? Because yeah. what, what you're talking about, you're talking about the what's essentially overcoming at least enough of this trauma to train, right? And 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 I, I have not endured what you're talking about, but I'm you know statistically, unfortunately, we have plenty of people listening to this show right now who have, and some of them may not have had the the time or the people around them or whatever to be able to move through. So we're we're talking about and and help me understand and help them understand. So we're talking about not only your ability to process, we're talking about an environment where you're feeling comfortable. We're talking about people that you're feeling comfortable. We're talking about your own skills within your training and somehow a combination of those. And, and this isn't me in disbelief, but me in wonder that <laughs> a combination of those has helped you move forward enough that I mean, what would you describe it as bruises up and down your arms? Uh, that, yeah, I've got kind of a bumper on the head right now, too. And <laughs> I, I hurt my rotator cuff. <laughs> sure. So and, and you're and you're laughing about it. Right. And it doesn't sound forced. It's genuine. And I'm sure everybody listening can hear that. So this, this is a piece that I want to get into a, a little bit more, if you're willing, because I think there's something really educational for the rest of us here. What did that process, what did that exploration of this horrible incident through your training, how did that unpack and what advice might you have for others who have similar things to work through? Well, I would have never just started training if I didn't have like a psychiatrist and a psychologist to talk to. And when I first started to get sick, the doctors I had, I didn't like, I didn't feel like they had my best interests, and they seemed pretty uninterested in my pain, you know, as a generality. Um, so it took me a while to find the right doctors, find the right kind of therapy, find a community of people that I could talk to about it, be it you know, online. Um, I've been to um, healing retreats with uh, Indigenous women veterans where I've been through the sweat lodge. Um, you know, I've tried, I've tried everything. Uh, meds, meditation, yoga. Um, the big one um, was I did, for one trauma, I did something called CPT, Cognitive Processing Therapy, mm -hmm. and it really, um, I don't want to say desensitizes, but it helps to process what's going on in your brain by kind of talking to a therapist about it and getting it on paper and kind of breaking it down. So I have this three ring binder, which is probably four inches thick of all the different classes I took, all the things that I found helpful, the different, um, you know, you break down different negative beliefs you have around the world and something as simple as learning how to challenge a negative thought or negatively held belief is incredibly powerful. Um, and learning mindfulness, learning how to breathe, keeping a journal, um, different things work for different people, but I would have never got better had I just stopped trying anything. And one of the things that really gave me hope 
uh, about healing because, you know, for a longest time, even when I had started being a public speaker about PTSD, like I kind of understood healing from combat trauma, but that was before um, uh, the big assault, <laughs> the big assault. Oh God, <laughs> sorry. Um, you're yeah. you're laughing about it, which I think says um, more than than anything else could. And and I suspect that the people <laughs> listening, if they're at all like me, hear you applying a little bit of humor to that incident, yeah. and are probably smiling and and happy to hear that you're at a place where you can do that. Yeah, it took it took a while. Um, I was a mess, and. I just wouldn't give up. But the other part of that is I just, I had gotten to a point where I knew I had to ask for help. And there's something I feel like about us as Americans where there's this idea of like rugged individualism in America, where if you can't do it all alone, you're a weak person. Well, no, that's crap. Like, from the perspective of, like, an anthropologist or a sociologist, like, unless you have a community or a tribe, you're alone. Why is it so hard to ask for, I mean, I know why it's hard, because sometimes there's a big stigma behind getting treatment for mental health. There's a big stigma behind counseling. People think that if you go to counseling or if you go to a psychiatrist, um, There's something, you know, inherently wrong with you. You're a crazy person. Well, no, because from the understanding I've gained of just a little bit of neuroscience, like when you have PTSD, when you have trauma, when you have complex PTSD, um, your brain is essentially stuck in the state of fight or flight, right? So your brain your amygdala is what controls fight or flight. It's like your body's, you know, smoke alarm. And people that have trauma or PTSD, we it's like we have a faulty smoke alarm, okay? So instead of going off when we sense real danger, it's going off all the time. And it affects the way the other parts of our brain work. It actually rewires the way your brain works. It can mess with your hippocampus. It can mess with your memories. And the other part of that is, I mean, take a second. Let's think about all of the things our body does when it's stuck in fight or flight at all. You sweat, you, you know, breathe more shallow. You, um, as like a biological imperative, your bowels or your bladder either evacuate or completely bind up. A lot of people with trauma have issues with their stomach um, and don't know why. It's because your body is constantly in caveman mode where you are expecting the saber toothed tiger in the room, but there isn't one there anymore. And the therapies that they have, be it, you know, cognitive processing therapy or EMDR, they help you get to the point where you can help turn off your faulty smoke alarm in your brain. If that makes sense. Does that make sense? It does for me. I've been pretty fortunate. I've been exposed to some some people who practice some pretty cool stuff, EMDR and some similarities, PDTR and, and some of these other wonderful therapies. And, and uh, you know, going into those is probably a bit beyond the scope, but if someone's listening and some of the stuff that you're talking about is resonating, mm-hmm. there are a lot of amazing practitioners out there who can help with this stuff just as, as you've experienced. And, and you know, I, I've been fortunate enough to uh, receive help for some things in some of these ways as well. And it's, it's powerful, powerful medicine. Mm-hmm. And the other thing, you know, a lot of people have a stigma around 
uh, taking medication. Like if you are depressed and your body does not make enough serotonin, you don't just have a negative outlook on life. You, your body just isn't making the proper chemicals. You know what I mean? Some people, meds are not the answer. They might just need a certain type of therapy, but don't struggle alone because you're stuck. Um, and I know it's super, super easy to get discouraged, uh, but healing is possible. I, for two years, thought I was just going to die. I thought I was resigned to feel like I was in hell forever. It was the absolute darkest time of my entire life and I got better. I don't know how, I mean, exactly. I don't necessarily know why me, but it's possible. And what about now? What does training look like now? What does your your eye towards the the emotional component mm -hmm. that I would imagine is is still very much part of, if not the what, but the why that you're training? How do, how does all that kind of coalesce for you as a martial artist today? Well, unfortunately you know, since COVID it's, it's a bit harder to train. <laughs> sure, sure. We're all, we're, we're all, we're all frustrated yeah. at that. <laughs> um, so there are, you know, usually to be safe, I train, um, now with one partner, um, that's like my dedicated partner for Krav Maga or with BJJ. Um, if we'll practice a technique, we'll, you know, practice just together, wear a mask. Um, I just hurt my shoulder last week, so I won't be training anytime soon, but I, I really look forward to it. Usually when I train, like before COVID, I would train Monday through Thursday and then work, you know, have a regular workout Friday and then work on BJJ on Saturday. And when I started jujitsu, I liked it so much for the grappling aspect that um, I enrolled my daughter. Mm. And I love um, the coaches and the owner of my gym. They're completely fantastic people. When they found out um, some of my backstory and why I came to train, uh, they gave my daughter a six month like free scholarship to study at their school. It was crazy. Um, I love jujitsu for her because she's at the age where you don't always want to teach a seven year old how to punch somebody. However, you know, if if a bully comes at her and she needs to sweep somebody bigger, she could do that without necessarily beating on them, um, which is what Aikido did for me when I was in high school. Like, instead of punching some girl in the face that came at me, I put her in a wrist lock and pinned her to a locker. Um, but I... I don't see myself stopping training at all. I had a discussion with um, the head coach where I go about our women's self-defense program uh, because they have an eight week self-defense course that they usually run. Unfortunately, it's not running now, but uh, because I love to train because I, used to train soldiers and because I know, um, you know, the stuff that we talked about, about assault and who does the assaulting, I spoke to him specifically. I was like, you know what? I 
would really like to get involved uh, with the women's program. And he's like, I think that's an awesome idea. Um, so does Liz, let's go for it. I'm like, yes, but we're not open for business. <laughs> <laughs> But It'll I, end soon. Hopefully, people who are listening to this in the future will will be saying, "Oh yeah, that that's that COVID thing's already done." Thank thankfully, yeah, you know, this is history. Oh, I hope so. <sighs> Can't be soon enough, though. I understand. Yeah. And so, do you do you have any goals? You know, you you mentioned you're not going to stop training, but if you start to consider the future and you look out, you know, a year, a few years, a bunch of years. Are, you, are there things you're looking at saying, you know, I hope that I can accomplish X in that time? Uh, it's, it's hard because as well as I'm doing now, um, healing from trauma isn't always a linear process. Like I, I have bad days still where I can't do stuff, but overall I'm doing really well. So <clears throat> I, through the um, Department of Veterans Affairs, I'm considered 100% disabled because I don't function necessarily normal. I function well for me, but not like other people, I guess. I don't know how else to explain that. Um, like I could take care of my daughter, I could do normal stuff, but I'm not going to be a CEO anytime soon just because of different, you know, I can't remember certain things because even though I have had therapy and I do take meds, I still have like cognitive issues. And one of my uh, medications um, can sometimes cause problems with my speech, but like little goals I have. Um, I, you know, a, a black belt is a nice goal. I'm 35. Maybe that'll happen by the time I'm 40. Who knows? <laughs> Not going to place bets on it. Um, and buying a house is my other one. Nice. Two great goals. Goals that seem to actually have a lot in common as I look at them. Um, <laughs> you know, some something that you can rely on something that you can reflect on and say, this is a, this is a grounding point. Yeah. I get it. What if people want to find you online? Are you, you on social media? I am. Um, my Facebook is just listed under my name, Robin, R-O-B-Y-N-N, Murray, M-U-R-R-A-Y. There's a lovely photo of me with green hair. Um, <laughs> And my Instagram is Vetty Ran Robin, V E T T Y R A N R O B Y N N. So, you know, Vetty Ran, like Vet E Ran. Ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll make sure to link those for the show notes yeah. for, for people. <laughs> right on. This is this has been great, and now this is kind of your opportunity to to tie it off. How how do you, what words do you want to leave the listeners with? You know, what what are your final thoughts? So, ah, one thing I guess it uh, not necessarily a goal, but a side project that myself and some women are um, talking about, thinking of. Um, I belong online to a women's grappling forum and day after day, you know, not a week goes by where we don't get a story from one of the women about like assault or harassment at their schools or finding out that, you know, somebody they've trained with had got convicted of something and some of the other women and I got together and we are trying to think of an ethical and legal way to uh, either discourage or ban violent sexual offenders from um, 
learning martial arts like you know something violent that they could use to assault their next victim um which some people think is a privacy issue um which i i can i guess respect that opinion but i would really feel horrible if something i taught someone was used to make someone else their victim but i don't know that's forthcoming i guess i can yeah. keep you all apprised of it Please. um because since most of us working on it are moms and we all have to homeschool now it's not exactly coming <laughs> along as fast as we had expected <laughs> And any anything else? Any anything? You know, if, if if somebody listened to you know just a couple minutes, you know, if we not not that we're going to do this, but let's say we we took the this last bit here and said this is this is it. This is the summary or the most important stuff or, or whatever you want to call it like that. You know, what what would those words be? Um, it would be. You know, no matter what, where you're coming from, like no matter what trauma you have, um, healing is possible and you can find a healing aspect in the martial arts community with the right gym and the right people. Um, I have been in gyms where it's kind of a, a macho, like prove your worth attitude and that's definitely not the right kind of environment for for women like me who have left violence issues um but training is possible and finding a good training environment and good coaches is almost as important as is like finding a good therapist when you're coming from a trauma background you want somebody that's going to encourage you and teach you techniques rather than you know, belittle you and almost victimize you further. You don't deserve that. Um, women, we don't have to be nice. And like they say on my favorite murder, you know, well, politeness. You don't have to be nice. You can declare your space. You don't have to be nice to anyone. And you do not have to compromise your safety or your values or your voice to make someone else feel more comfortable. Which we don't get to walk around being jerks to everybody, but at the same time, we do not have to be shrinking violets to make other people feel better. This was an important episode, and I'm really thankful to you, Ms. Murphy, for coming on the show, for talking about this, for being so open with such a difficult thing. Now, I don't know how many of you out there listening may identify with parts of today's episode. I hope that if you do, however, you will seek help. I hope that you will understand that you are not alone and that you will continue to fight figuratively or literally if necessary to heal. It's this subject that I think is, is the best example of the power of martial arts to do what seems to be the opposite of martial arts. We talk about training to protect ourselves and to use violence when necessary. And yet, martial arts is so powerful that it can be used to recover from violence, to heal to help others do the same. And it's reason number who knows what on the list of reasons that I love martial arts and I will continue to fight for it and spread it wherever I can. So thank you again, Robin, for coming on the show. I appreciate your time and your story. If you want to know more, see more, 
Go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Check out this and every other episode. This is episode 550, and you're going to find photos and links, a bunch of resources, as well as every other episode we've ever done. You can sign up for the newsletter while you're over there. And if you're willing to support the work that we do, we've got a bunch of options. You could visit the store, whistlekick.com, use the code PODCAST15 to save 15%. You might also consider buying one of our Amazon books, telling others about the show, or supporting us at patreon.com slash whistlekick. And I hope that if you see somebody out there rocking something with a whistle kick on it, you'll introduce yourself. And if you've got guest suggestions, let me know. Jeremy at whistlekick.com is my email address. At Whistlekick is our social media everywhere you could shake a stick, whether that be a tunfa, a bow, a joe, boken, a screamer. Oh, there's a lot of different wooden tools that we use. <laughs> I could get sidetracked here, but I won't. Instead, I will simply say thank you for your time and your support. And until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. Bye.